Okay, so uh, we went on, on Tuesday, we talked about perspective and we did a perspective exercise and I asked people to complete two assignments related to perspective. So just as a reminder, we looked at this image. It's an 18th century, it's from an 18th century perspective manual um, by a, I think he was a Dutch, um, I'm not sure if he was an artist or not, to be honest with you. He's known for this perspective manual. His, his name was Vredeman de Vries. Last name is D-E-V-R-I-E-S. And so this uh, image shows us several of those elements we went over, um, the basic elements of perspective, the horizon line here, which represents the eye level of the viewer, um, the orthogonals that show the way uh, objects in a perspective space will diminish in size as they move backwards in space. And all of uh, lines that demarcate the planes on objects, those lines which are parallel to one another will recede towards a common vanishing point. So these lines that describe the tiles on this floor plane as those lines diminish in size or as those individual tiles diminish in size as they move away from us, they diminish in size in a consistent and predictable way such that those lines eventually meet at a common vanishing point on the horizon line. Um, when objects are, are lower, progressively lower than our eye level, we see more of the top planes as we can see on these geometric forms in this space. As objects approach our eye level, we, we no longer see the plane, right? The plane reads as a straight line. So this tabletop, which is at about the eye level of the viewer, we no longer see um, the planes, the top and the bottom planes, right? We see the top planes of these objects here we don't see the top planes of this tabletop because it's roughly at eye level. So we did some exercises where we plotted out a perspective space using a horizon line and we drew uh, imaginary boxes in that perspective space to start getting a sense of how um, how planes recede in, in perspective. So, um, and then we did a simple still life. So people would have done something like this. And we drew these simple forms so that we could start studying simple structures, simple observed structures and how those simple observed structures respond to a perspective space. So we have the top of the shelf that I was drawing from here. Uh, we, we drew it observationally, but noted, noted the way the lines that are parallel to one another in this space recede towards a common vanishing point. So this line and this line, if we were to extend them out, they would, or they appear to successfully diminish in space towards a vanishing point. So in a, in a way we're starting our, the next phase or the next development in our drawing curriculum with this still life. So we've started to think about how objects in space uh, work in perspective. So when we're drawing something like a cube or maybe a cone, a cones may be a little bit more complex, something like a cube or a cube-like form like the shelf that these objects were sitting on, it's relatively easy for us to portray those objects as clearly existing in space, right? So we want to draw a cube so that it appears to be a palpable, physical three-dimensional object in a space, remember? And, and so we think about that as opposed to the reality of the two-dimensional flatness of the drawing paper. We're trying to turn that flatness into something that 
is believable, is believably understood as a collection of three-dimensional forms in a perspective space, a space that we could move our hand into, a space that we could literally walk into, right? We're trying to create that illusion. And trying to create that illusion with something like a cube is relatively easy. Now, of course, it's not, as people probably discovered, it's not all that easy to really see exactly how the angles move through space, exactly how they move in relationship to each other. Nevertheless, when we have flat, broad planes, like the flat, broad planes of uh, a cube, it's relatively easy to represent those as moving through space. If we properly see the way the lines that demarcate the perimeter of that plane uh, diminish in size in a perspective space, then we're, then we're well on our way to successfully communicating this as a convincing volume in a convincing space. I'm sorry, Professor, so, I have a question. Yes. Do you want us to draw like the desk as well for the assignment? Or you yeah, ind indicate the tabletop so that you have some sense. You don't have to draw it elaborately, but just indicate it with some perspective lines to, to show the space the objects are sitting in. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yep. Sure. Uh, I'm going to point out, you know, looking now that I'm looking at my drawing um, after it's been photographed, I suspect that this line is off. That line here looks like it's a little bit too extreme of a perspective. I don't have the still life set up anymore, so I can't check, but it looks like I didn't quite get this line right. Um, okay, so relatively easy to represent something like a simple cube in space. So let me skip ahead for a minute. When we're drawing something like the complex volumes of a human being, or as Katie Colwitz is doing here in her self-portrait, or the, or, the, or the less complex, but nevertheless complex volumes of something like a piece of fruit, as I'm gonna draw today, it's much more difficult to successfully represent that object as a, as a volume existing in space. So an early development or one of the steps artists um, developed in order to successfully represent the complexity of nature, successfully represent the complexity of nature as fully three-dimensional and existing in space on a flat surface, artists began to realize that they could interpret nature or natural forms according to the underlying simplicity of geometry and the underlying simplicity of geometric forms in a perspective space. So in your sketchbook that you're gonna complete for the weekend, you're gonna do a study of this drawing. And this is a drawing by an early 20th century teacher, used to teach at the Art Students League in New York named George Bridgman. It's a famous teacher. He has famous books on figure structure. Um, and he, this is a drawing he did where he is illustrating to students and analyzing the way we can understand the complex volumes of the human head in a simplified way in a perspective frame. So if we understand the underlying volumes of the human head um, as sitting within the space of a perspective structure, then we, we, are, we, we, we have taken the first step to successfully representing that complex volume and the complex anatomy as a believable three-dimensional volume in space. So this is a very early example of an artist who's in, in the early process of discovering those principles. This is a famous German painter named Albrecht Dürer, who was painting in the 16th century in Germany. And uh, he's often credited with bringing the developments of the Italian Renaissance up into Northern Europe. And so this is a sheet of studies from his famous sketchbook where he's trying to understand the human figure as a series of geometric volumes in order to be able to clearly represent the human figure in space. 
This is a more recent example of an artist doing that. Um, I actually don't know who these drawings are by. I found this online. Um, it was an uncredited drawing online, but it's a common approach to understanding the complexity of the human form so that we can clearly represent something like a complex human foot as a, a, a believable volume, right? A volume that we, we have a sense that we can wrap our hand around that, right? We understand the structure and the space. We can read the space as it moves from an element on that form that's closer to us, like the big toe, um, into a believable um, distance back to the heel. Same thing here, the heel is closer to us. We absolutely believe that plunging into space of this volume um, as, it, as we move across the arch of the foot to the point on the floor plane where that foot is planted. Um, the artist here is also studying the anatomy of the foot, um, which is an advanced component of understanding the human figure in drawing, um, which people may or may not eventually be interested in pursuing. So um, just examples of artists using the principles of perspective and geometric forms as a way to understand more complex volumes. And we're gonna be starting to do that today. Uh, okay, so this is another drawing by Albrecht Dürer. So Dürer, the, the same artist who did these drawings here, uh, I'm just trying to understand the human head not only in terms of a perspectival set of planes, right, a sequence of planes that clearly move around the volume of the head. So, and while this is not a, a simple perspective box, notice the way these small planes that all together make up the overall structure of the head are moving according to the rules of perspective. So this plane here, as, these, as this plane moves away from us in space, this edge is closer to us than this edge. These two lines of the plane diminish towards a common vanishing point. These two lines diminish towards a common vanishing point. So we have a clear sense of being able to move from a plane that's closer to us. We start to turn away as this plane moves at an oblique angle to the picture plane this plane is moving more rapidly away from or at a more rapidly descending angle relative to the picture plane. And so we have a sense of uh, that being at a more extreme perspective. So the artist is understanding the human head as a complex perspectival structure. It's a little awkward in some ways, like clearly he's overstated the anatomy of the throat and Adam's apple, but still we get the idea of what the artist is trying to do. So this is a, a self-portrait drawing by Katie Kollwitz. I showed one of her images on Tuesday. She was a late 19th, early 20th century sculptor and printmaker. And um, one of her beautiful drawings. And so you'll, you'll see, you, no, you'll notice in this more naturalistically rendered drawing, um, notice how she's observing the light and shadow as conforming to the planar structure that Durer, she, she's not looking directly at the Durer, but the way she's understanding the complex volumes of the head and, and the reason she's able to convincingly communicate to us that this is a fully three-dimensional volume existing in a space is she's conscious of the way the complex volumes of the human head correspond to a planar understanding of volume. So not only do we see the way the shadow plane on uh, her head, the way the, the form turns into shadow at the, at the, according to the planes as they turn away from the light source, similar to the planar structure here in the Dura drawing. But also notice the way she has carefully considered the drawing of all elements in the self-portrait so that they reinforce a sense of planar structure. So if you notice on this drawing by Albrecht Durer, he is 
constructing the forehead volume as a series of faceted planes that move up to a high point at an angle across the broad flat plane of the forehead. So we get a series of planes turning at clearly discernible locations through space, right? These planes, this plane is moving in one direction. This plane is moving in a different direction through space. This plane is moving in yet another direction and so on as we wrap around the full volume of the forehead. Look at every element um, Katie Kollwitz has included in this drawing. Notice how the line of the eyebrow and the line of the hair uh, rolling across the forehead correspond to this line here of the planar structure and this line here of the planar structure. Right? So she's very consciously thinking of every line, every element in this drawing as sitting on a specific plane that's located in a specific space. She leaves out most information here so we don't have any clear indication of the movement of what would be the equivalent of these planes. But notice the little lock of hair on the far side of the forehead. Notice that line, that ang the angle of that line corresponds roughly to the angle of this planar, planar structural line here. So she's really deliberately noticing how every element she puts into this drawing corresponds to a movement of the planar structure of the entire volume. Notice the highlights on the hair, this line here on the highlight, this line here, describing the top of the head, that line and that line are very similar, right? So she's continuing to think in a planar way, even though ultimately she's showing us what we believe to be a naturalistically rendered volume. This is just another comparison. This is from a, a artistic anatomy book that includes a planar analysis of the structure of the human head. So this is a, you know, a decent planar simplification of the human head. And again, you can see the corresponding, the correspondence between the planar structure here and the planes as Katie Collowitz is understanding them. So for example, we see, we believe the full volume and space of this nose because she has conceived of it as a simple planar volume. It has a front plane, just as the simplified nose has here. It has a side plane indicated with this half tone and little bits of shadow, just as this nose has a side plane. And then we see clearly this underplane, right? The nose, this planar structural nose has an underplane. It's like a little inverted shelf. And Katie Kollwitz has seen the light and shadow on her nose in such a way that we read it both as an anatomical volume, but also as a kind of inverted shelf, okay? So we're going to be stepping into those basic principles today as we do our next more complex still life, or we're gonna be starting to explore some of those principles. Okay, so let me... Okay, so I just want to, um, I know I've, I've said this already, but I want to just emphasize it again before we start our demo today. So what we have here, remember, we, we always want to be thinking in the terms I'm about to describe. So what we have is a flat surface, right? And so a flat surface has, it has two dimensions. It has height 
and it has width. So that's the reality of the surface we're working on. We're creating drawing. But we want to take this flat surface, the height and width of this flat surface, and we want to draw objects so that they appear to move through a space. So we want to make this drawing appear to have not just height and width, but we want it to appear to have that third dimension, depth, right? And then we want to make, make the depth contain believable three-dimensional objects. So we talked about how to do that in this, by starting with this sim simple uh, approach to perspective, which um, hopefully everybody has completed that exercise. So now we're going to be drawing a slightly more compli complex still life. And, whoops. We'll be drawing a slightly more complex still life. And, and using those principles, the principles of perspective, and then how the principles of perspective can be applied to um, understanding more complex volumes. So volumes that are more complex than the simple um, objects we drew on Tuesday. So let me, I'm just gonna adjust things here. So, so that the tripod's not so much in my way. Okay. Now remember, because of the position of the camera, your point of view in relation to the still life is gonna be a little bit different than what I'm seeing. But so I'm going to start the still life the same way I did on, the same way I did on Tuesday. So I'm gonna start by roughing in the major elements. So I'm starting by indicating, I'm indicating on the left, the cone. So I am, I'm setting up just like I did on Tuesday, I'm setting up a rough center line and a horizontal axis for the ellipse. And so as people are drawing um, your objects and you're drawing your ellipse, um, if people feel like the ellipse doesn't quite look right, go to the, uh, go to Blackboard. There's, I, I, I've uploaded a, a document that I think pretty well illustrates how to draw an ellipse. So it'll give you the information you need if you feel like your ellipse is not quite working. So now I'm going to very broadly indicate um, my pepper. And I'm going to just use some, some broad um, lines roughing in where that is in relationship to the cone I've started. So I'm looking at the angle from the lower right-hand corner or the lower left-hand corner of the cone to the bottom of the pepper. I'm estimating that. So I'm gonna check that, I'm gonna check that angle and then see how that relates to my drawing. So I'm not drawing anything um, specific yet with any kind of complexity. I'm just setting up the big relationship between the objects and the still life. So I'm drawing a line across to where the relationship between the pepper and 
the teapot. So notice as I'm starting to block in the pepper, I'm using a series of straight lines. So I'm not yet trying to wrap my line around all of the organic nuances of that pepper. And the reason I'm not doing that is I want to, to, in spite of the fact that this is a complicated, or re, let's say relatively complicated organic form, the first thing I want to do is see that volume in perspective. In exactly the same way the artist Albrecht Durer was trying to understand that head in perspective, or the way that Bridgman head was represented in perspective. So I, I want to establish this object as a perspectival volume so that that sits in a space before I represent it as, or before I represent it with all of its organic complexity. And so using a series of straight lines helps me do that because I can immediately start thinking about the planes that this that, that make up this pepper. And I can think about the direction of those planes. So for example, you'll notice on the pepper we see a shadow plane, right? Now we're not going to be using light and shadow in this drawing, but you can see here a shadow plane. And what that is revealing to us is that this relatively broad flat area. Right, the broad flat area of that pepper that my pencil right now is resting against, that plane is moving in direction, whoops. Wait, I, it looks like I'm gonna need to. I may, I may need to retake this paper at some point, let's see. So that, that shows me that that plane on that object is moving through space like this. And I want to set that up. I want to start setting up the clarity of these objects moving through space. So again, I, I mentioned that this pepper has a, a plane that's moving in a specific direction through space. Maybe a bit better to use the pencil this way so it points. So that plane is moving that way. It has a kind of front plane that's moving backwards in space. It has a top plane that my pencil can sit on top of. So I want to represent all of those, those uh, large planar volumes before I get into any of the organic complexity. So I'm starting with a series of straight lines that sort of encase the, the the organic volume in a kind of scaffolding that's going to allow me to clearly represent that volume uh, as moving through space. So, okay, so I have a rough in of, of my cone and my pepper. Um, now I want to start placing the teapot and I'm going to be, again, approaching this teapot with the same kind of structural simplicity. And I'm also going to be asking myself or really carefully looking at the proportion, the, the proportional sizes of the space between the, the pepper and the teapot, how, how big that space is compared to the pepper, let's say. So to me, it looks like it's maybe a little bit larger than a third of the pepper. My, my first estimation is that it starts about there. So you are not, in, in my drawing, you'll notice that the space seems quite a bit larger. Let me just show you, from my point of view, the space of that between the teapot and the pepper is something more like that. So I'm gonna just, broadly state the overall angle of that um, 
essentially it's a line, but it's a kind of arcing line. So now here, now this is a little bit, the relationship between the teapot, the pepper and the cone is a little bit more complex than the relationships we started with, the relationships between the cone and the box. So now I have to look at a series of relationships. So I'm going to look at my, at the top of the pepper, I'll refine that a little bit. And I'm going to look at how that top corner relates to the bottom corner of my teapot. I'm going to look at how the top corner of the pepper relates to the point on the teapot where the cover sits on the top opening. That angle is something like that. And you want to use those kinds of um, lines that will help you determine placement. So I should have roughly placed in a roughly accurate way the, the bottom left corner of the teapot and the left hand side of the opening of the teapot. Now what I'm doing is I'm putting in the horizontal axes of the, the ellipses that make up this form. So here's one ellipse, right? So the tops of these forms are, are circles, but we, but as those circles move, um, or as the angle of the plane of that circle um, moves to, to a more and more oblique angle relative to the, to the picture plane, we see those circles as ellipses, right? So this here is an ellipse and in the, in the, in the um, screen, or as you are looking at it, this ellipse reads as essentially a straight line, right? Because that ellipse is at roughly the same, exactly the level of uh, the, the lens of the camera. Um, this ellipse is slightly more open. So it's slightly more circular because it's lower than the lens of the camera. So I'm seeing now my, my eyes are a little bit higher than the lens of the camera. So I'm seeing this ellipse as slightly open. I'm gonna make one change. I think my overall, the line of that teapot is at a bit of a more, bit more of an angle. And remember a, a, a rule of perspectival drawing is that an ellipse is always the, the long axis or the major axis of the ellipse. So this is called the major axis. Same thing as the long axis or the horizontal axis of the ellipse is always going to be represented um, as absolutely horizontal, so parallel to the edge of your page. And how open am I seeing that? Looks, yeah, about like that. I'm seeing it open above this slide. Now I'm going to place the central axis of that teapot because just like our cone, that teapot is pretty much symmetrical. And I can, now that, now that I have my central, my major axis of the bottom ellipse. I can place this. Ellipse. Thank you. 
And um, drawing an ellipse, you want to you want to try to develop the ability to draw it in sort of large sweeping motions. Don't don't tighten, get yourself tightened up because you're trying to get it right. Instead, try to develop the ability uh, to make convincing structural lines with as large a sweeping motion as you can. You're gonna have some scraggly loose lines in there, but you can always clean that up. So this ellipse is slightly more open than this ellipse. But this is slightly more closed ellipse. And again, I have my central axis for that teapot. So I know that that teapot is roughly symmetrical or it's symmetrical. I'm not, I don't know why I'm saying roughly. So I'm not, I'm not drawing one thing and finishing it and then drawing another. I'm roughing in these objects, working everything at this stage, um, up to about the same level, um, just so that I can really successfully draw all these different elements. I'm drawing things as if they're made out of glass so I can see through them. So that helps me place the ellipse of that cone in the back. So I could also, maybe I should have done this, I could also draw this teapot as a series of straight lines. It'll help me place that. It'll help me convincingly place that arc. You can also, I've talked about it with the pepper. I've talked about an approach where you're drawing organic forms with straight lines. And, um, but I, I think that it's, I think that it's actually better to, to um, say draw organic forms with straight lines and tight arms. So that gives you a better, I think that's just a, a a way of using that basic principle, that straight line approach, but bringing it right from the start to a more organic sense of what you're drawing. So I'm drawing these elements as tight arcs. Okay, so before I go any further than this, I am going to I'm going to make some measurements. I'm also just gonna put in the back line of that shelf. Okay. So uh, I want to, I wanna see, I wanna figure out if, if the proportion of this teapot is accurate relative to the proportion of that pepper. So I'm gonna do the same thing I explained on Tuesday, I'm going to measure the width of the pepper. So I'm going to take that width. This is called, by the way, comparative measure, measuring. And I'm going to ask myself how many times that width fits into this pepper. One, a little bit less. I'm going to change the way I do that. Uh, I, I mean, the width of the pepper fits into the teapot. So I'm going to take the, the, the greatest dimension of the pepper. So the dimension of the pepper was widespread. 
and I'm going to compare it to the width of the ellipse on the teapot. So it goes in once, twice, and just a little bit more. So the greatest width of that pepper should go into the teapot once, twice, and then a little bit more. So my teapot needs to get just a little bit wider. So uh, it needs to get about this much wider. So I'm just going to bring that edge over. And I'm going to need to bring the central axis over just a little bit. That's a little bit too much. Still too much. So just adjusting these different elements. I don't have to completely redraw the ellipse. I'm just going to extend it. Clean up my scratchy line. Okay, so I think I've got the sizes about right. And I have some pretty convincing, um, I think pretty convincing representation of those objects so far. You know, it's when I photograph this after class, I may realize like in my previous still life that something's off. That all often happens. So just sharpening this pencil. Okay, so now I have a rough in of my overall still life. I do feel a little bit like these objects could be moved over a little bit. I'm not going to do that um, because I don't want to delay some of the things we're going to talk about today, but um, it could be a bit. Uh, I, just compositionally, I feel like it would be a little bit better, although maybe I can work with this. Um, so try something I want. I think it would be better for you all to see this still life a little bit closer to the way I see it. So I'm just going to see how this changes if it does. Is someone trying to get in? Does anyone see try someone trying to get in? Uh, by the way, um, let me just say here, my, 
I believe my cell phone number is on the syllabus. If you're, tr if you're trying to get in and not getting through to either myself or somebody else in class, um, you can text me. In general, I don't, I ask people not to text me. So if you need to communicate with me, please communicate with me by email. Um, but if you're, if you're trying to get into class and cannot, um, then you can text me. I, I noticed people were setting up a Discord um, way, method of communication. Is Can you all communicate with each other on Discord um, during class if someone's having trouble getting in? Sure. You can. Okay, so maybe that's a, an approach someone, it's another option. Okay, so where were we? All right, so I have my... edge of the table. Okay, so let's now start looking at, let me just see if this works, if I raise this up. Yeah, I think that's fine. I don't think that's too distorted. And that's a little bit closer to what I'm seeing. So you're able to see a little bit better the, um, the top plane of the pepper, for example, I mean, it, it, it now makes, because of three-point perspective, because we're looking down on that pepper a little bit, it looks like it's, it's at kind of a, an, it looks like it's tilting to the left where it's not really, I mean, that's again, the distortion of the lens, but I think that's a little bit better. You can see the ellipses and the, and the planes a little bit closer to the way I'm seeing them. Okay, so now I want to, now that I'm pretty sure that the, the size of the pepper, the size of my teapot, I can be pretty confident that the size of my cone is accurate just by eye, because if this is accurate relative to my teapot, then I can pretty easily determine based on the shapes, the negative shapes. So the shapes of the parts of the cone that I can see around that, I can be pretty confident that this is, size of this cone is accurate. And um, if I were doing this drawing on my own, I would check that, but I'm not going to check it just again so that we don't, I don't want to dwell too much on that. I will clean up a few of my lines here before I go on. Okay, so I want to start drawing this pepper so that I get a clear sense right from the start of that planar structure. In other words, the, the sense of this pepper having multiple dimensions, right? And, and draw this so that all of these elements are clearly moving through space. So I am going to now start indicating all of the planes or the, the, the major planes on this volume. So remember, I'm starting with a series of straight lines. And just to make a little bit more clear the importance of this approach. So I have looked at, I've interpreted the pepper not in terms of that, you know, a kind of wire that's been twisted around the exact shape of that. I've, I'm interpreting it in terms of the major, a way of breaking this down into the major straight lines of this of this form. So these avoiding details and just seeing this a sequence of straight lines again that create a kind of architecture around this volume. So um, now I'm deliberately avoiding this, right? So I'm not drawing, I'm not looking at the pepper and then just kind of casually, you know, like a kid does it doing this. Maybe I'm exaggerating that a little bit. I'm not doing that. And I'm not doing that because I don't want to end up with just a flat shape. I don't want to start this drawing where I'm trying to create a believable space and believable 
uh, volumetric structures. Uh, I don't want to start where I think of things as flat shapes, right? If I start it like this, that ends up looking like a decal that's on a refrigerator. And I don't want to draw decals. I want to draw convincing structural volumes. So I'm looking at, I, I started with those straight lines describing you know, the simplified contour. And now I'm going to start looking at the way I can start creating or interpreting this object as a volume in space. So I notice there's a, a relationship between the tops of the, the curves of the pepper that create a straight line that's moving through space in perspective like this. And that defines the top plane of the pepper. I'm looking at the way the relationship between those two uh, little swellings on the contour at the bottom of the pepper relate to each other along a straight line. So I'm going to be indicating that straight line. And what I've done now is I've created two lines that act as a kind of, again, as a kind of scaffolding that sits in perspective. So this line and this line are in a, perspecti a perspectival relationship to each other. And those lines in relationship to this line, the bottom of the pepper, and then a similar line on the shadow plane or the top of that shadow plane of the pepper. It's moving through space. I'm going to block that in. And now, just as I can put my pencil on top of that pepper because it has a top plane that moves through space and shows us a point closer to us and then a point further away, I've mapped out that plane, right? And so right away in this drawing, or I've created a situation in this drawing where that pepper, while very simply geometrically roughed in, nevertheless convincingly moves through space. One of the most important aspects of the kind of drawing we're working, that we're trying to make believable structures in space. So now that top plane, and by implication, this plane, the front plane and the side plane, those are now starting to clearly move through space. So um, now I am going to use, now we're not going to model with light and shadow. So in other words, we're not going to use, we're not going to put down tone in these drawings. This is purely line. I am though going to notice the way the, sh the break in the shadow, we can see a line that tells us where the shadow, where the object turns from light into shadow. And I'm going to use that line to help me see the planar structure. So. I'm going to roughly indicate the line of light and shadow that's dividing my pepper into two major planes. So a front plane and then a side plane. So I'll keep this relatively simple for now. Block in the top plane of my pepper. So now I have pretty convincing volume. I can start to now break down these lines into more and more, progressively more straight lines. That's gonna get us closer to the organic form Okay, so the next thing I want to do is I want to draw the handle and the spout on that 
um, on that teapot. Now, just like I didn't just trace around those elements, uh, trace around the shape of the pepper, I'm, I'm, I'm likewise not going to to just um, kind of randomly or casually trace around the lines of the spout and the handle. So I want to get, I want to make these convincing and I, I need to break them down. I need to break down the ambiguous complexity of those things so that I can draw them convincing. So the spout is actually a kind of cone. Like we could think of that spout as having a kind of cone-like form. So we could think of the spout as being a kind of cone, moving something like this through space. And that cone is cut off at the top. And it connects to kind of longer, um, irregular form like this. So now I have to draw, I have to take that approach to drawing that element on the teapot. And that, and that cone, I mean, that the spout projects off that arcing line of the teapot. And so I'm looking at these angles. And so the angle of the spout is pretty much the same angle as this line of the pepper. sort of mimic each other. And then the angle of the spout projects off the teapot just below the line of the ellipse. And it's projecting off like this. And then we have our home like structure we indicated and that irregular form that connects the spout to the body of the teapot is something like this and I'm constructing that again as a series of straight lines so that I can make some sense out of the kind of ambiguous complexity of that form and then the spout has I'm going to look at where the top of the spout would intersect with the cone and let's see, I'm going to also indicate the top of the stem of my pepper. here. Now I see a, a, a small ellipse here. Start with something like this. Okay, so now before doing any finishing work on that or even really checking it, I can give it a little bit more of a sense of the actual curve to the profile of that spout. And adjust that a little bit. Now that, now I'm gonna look at how handle, how to draw the handle. Okay, so the handle is 
wrapping around the volume. So this year, I'm looking at the line of that um, handle as it wraps around the volume and it, and it sort of wraps around the volume of that teapot, sort of like a pocket does on the back of someone's pants, right? So the flat pocket wraps around the volume of a person's hips, right? The volume of a person's hips is determining the shape of the back of someone's pants and then the pocket on the pants would wrap around that volume. And that, the, the handle of the teapot emerges off of the back surface of the teapot, off of a line that wraps around that volume in a way similar to a pocket. And then the, the, lot, the angle of the handle top angle of the handle, something like that. And then I'm going to look at where that handle sits on the bottom. And I see a little bit of the teapot behind the handle. And so I'm, I'm going to break this handle down into also straight lines. So I can start to get a sense of, or so I can represent that handle convincingly. I don't, again, if I just try to do a, a loop right away, that's very difficult to do and make it convincing. So I'm instead going to start with. a series of straight lines that encase that curve. And I, find, I think it's gonna be much easier to represent that curve when I've broken down that curve into the series of um, angles that construct it. Okay, so here, if you'll allow me, I'm just going to take a photo of the drawing at this stage so that I can, I think it might be help, more helpful for people if I show, if I post a couple photographs of the drawing in different stages. So you take a quick photo and then I will continue. Okay, so I'm going to just continue with plotting out of this handle. And so people for this, the still life that you all set up, try to find, um, I, I would like you to include in it your cone or another very simple geometric object, like if people prefer to include a ball. 
blocks, that's fine. Um, a more complicated form, you know, something like this teapot um, that you nevertheless can interpret according to a kind of geometry. And then uh, a, a something, a, a, a piece of, or some kind of organic form, you know, something like a pepper or an orange probably would work. Um, an orange might be a little bit sim simple. Um, but some kind of organic form where you can practice interpreting organic forms according to um, according to a geometric planar approach. Okay, so I have those elements placed simply. I can using my central axis, I can indicate. I'll round off the top of my teapot. A little decorative sphere, I think, sits right around here. Okay, so let's take, now let's break down what we have here on the pepper. Just talk about the way we now bring this simplification closer and closer to the organic form. So I'm gonna start just further breaking down these straight lines. Let me also just say, I, I should have mentioned this right at the beginning, Another advantage to doing, to, to breaking down organic forms into simple um, constructions based on straight lines is one of the most important elements of making a contour drawing convincing is getting a convincing relationship between certain key points on the contour, certain high points on the contour and establishing a convincing angle relationship between them. So if you notice these certain, these high points on the contour, where there's a major change in the direction of the contour, all of these points here, you want to, uh, making a convincing contour depends on you setting up a convincing relationship between the different points. So you want the, the angle relationships from one point on the contour to another point to be convincing. And it's much easier to see those angle relationships when you start with this kind of straight line breakdown. So I'm going to now just, really what I'm doing is just adding more straight lines. And eventually we're going to arrive at a contour that no longer reads as being made up of straight lines. But that overall placement um, and, and the space we've constructed by thinking about by thinking about each of these lines we've put in as being located at a certain point in space, that space we've created is there. So now we're just, in a sense, refining this contour, adding really nuances or adding So I can start indicating those, the details of those swellings at the bottom.
So I'm not, I'm, I'm getting closer and closer to an organic contour, but I'm, I'm not, I'm not really, I'm still staying with straight lines as a way of getting there. Now, I, I will emphasize that I, I, I don't mean to suggest that artists always have to draw with nothing but straight lines. This is a tool. And certainly, like once you are able to see space and structure very easily, you can certainly start drawing through curves. And I just think that this is a useful tool for being able to draw organic objects that make them clearly exist. As structures in space. And remember, we're, we're doing this because it's relatively easy to make a drawing of geometric forms as volumes in space. It's much harder to make sense out of the complexity of organic nature. And so if, we're, if we see organic nature as in terms of a geometric simplification, it becomes easier for us to represent that complex volume in space or represent that form as a complex volume in space. start to indicate those. I don't know what these things are called on the network. There's kind of overlapping swellings that make up the outer membrane of the pepper. It's almost like the pepper has internal ribs. Seeing swelling of those shapes around the ribs. And I'm going to now draw the stem of the pepper. So you'll notice that the stem, there, there's a kind of almost an ellipse-like um, base to the stem. Um, so it's, it's almost like it's sort of the shape of the size, roughly the size of a quarter. It's as if that stem is emerging from sort of a coin sitting on top of that pepper, almost as if it's a coin on a tabletop. It's a little bit more uh, plainer than a coin. Part of it is hidden by one of the swellings of the top of the pepper.
So I'm going to treat the stem exactly like I've treated everything else. So I'm going to start it as a series of straight lines. And so I mentioned that the, the, the spout on the teapot was a kind of cone-like shape or cone-like volume. The stem is a kind of cylinder. It's a kind of twisted cylinder. Right, it's something like cylinder moving through space, but it's a cylinder that has a series of turns. And again, I'm always thinking about these natural elements I'm drawing in terms of a, a geometric simplification so that I can clearly represent these volumes as existing in space. So it's a cylinder that's doing something like that. Carefully look at the turns of that stem. Try to get the Try to get the exact movement of that stem. So I'm trying to get the shape, but also the way that volume moves through the space. So as it as it is closer to us and further away, and that stem, and I think you all can see it on the screen, the stem has a, a relatively or you, the, the stem clearly lends itself to be interpreted in terms of straight lines because there, there just are discernible straight lines in the way that organic shape moves through space. So just looking at the shape of my pepper, I think that I have to adjust some of these contours a little bit. I think it's a little bit wider at the top.
Just progressively adding smaller and smaller details. Check and continue to refine. Now, at this stage, I would go on to other elements in the drawing. Um, I think what we'll do now, I, I, there, there is a, a next step I want to talk about in this drawing, the development of this still life. I think I'll address that after our break. So why don't we take our class break now that I've gotten the drawing to this point, and then I will address the next step in this process. So this drawing obviously needs further development, cleaning up, refinement, but there's also another element to this approach to spatial, structural, linear drawing that I'll introduce after the break. So um, we'll take our 20 minute break and we'll get started again at 10.54, okay? Got it. Okay, Professor. Got it, thank you. Oh, wait, uh, Professor, I think you're on mute. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Hi, thanks. Thanks for letting no me know. Um, so before, I before going back to the demonstration, I wanted to look at two drawings to introduce um, a way of working with line. So this is a very simple drawing uh, by Rembrandt, the 17th century Dutch painter. I assume everyone has heard of Rembrandt at least. He's one of those artist household names like Van Gogh and Leonardo. Um, and Rembrandt would do many, he did innumerable quick sketches in, in ink and wash, something like this. I think that this is, a, a, in my opinion, a very beautiful drawing. It's very simple, but it's, full, in spite of its simplicity, is full of an incredible richness of information. Now, one thing that I think is incredibly beautifully communicated in this very simple drawing is how incredibly deep the space of the landscape is. So we have a very palpable sense of being able to move from landscape elements or architectural structures that are close to us here to the deep space of the background. So in spite of the simplicity of this drawing, or what, how is Rembrandt communicating that depth of space? What, what's he, what is he doing in order to communicate a depth of space? Grace? Um. So in the background, the lines are much lighter than in the foreground. And then in the foreground, um, he also has like larger objects and everything like the boat, the um, house, all that. 
Right. So that's exactly right. So Rembrandt is using actually a very conventional technique to show depth. He's varying line weight so that objects that are closer to us are depicted with a darker line and objects that are further away from us are depicted with a lighter line. And that, that's a kind of perspective called atmospheric perspective. Atmospheric perspective is that, pheno that visual phenomena where objects that are closer to us are, are clearer and more distinct and objects in the distance are more uh, hazy and less distinct. And that has to do with the way our eye picks up objects that are being seen through various depths of atmosphere. And so he's using that, he's understanding that principle and using line weight to reveal that. So there's one, so that's a really important element that he's using. There's one, there's another thing he does with his line. So like, let's notice this line here or this line here that's describing the place where the water meets the reeds along the river edge. What is he, what's he doing with this line, this line, this line, this line? What, how does, he, it's, these lines are darker than these lines, but there's something else he's doing with those lines that reinforces the sense of depth. Does anyone see what that is? He transitions yeah. from uh, like a thin line to a thicker line as he goes moves forward in the painting or picture. Right, that's exactly right. So the closer the line is to us, it's thicker. The further away it is, it's thinner. Right, thicker, thinner. So darker, lighter, thicker, thinner. But also these lines are thicker than any of these lines. Right. So he's varying line weight to show space. And Rembrandt actually does that very consistently in actually a very consistently across his drawings, you know, like in all of his drawings, but also he does it consistently in the drawing. So almost all the lines representing objects that are closer to us as thicker are, are thicker than all the lines representing objects that are further away from us. He does that in a, in a masterful way. Professor? Yes. He's also using diagonal lines to, to show depth, orthogonals. Orthogonals, that's right. So he's describing the, um, like, let's say the, uh, the crops in the middle distance um, using orthogonals. So we see these orthogonals receding perspectively. This line, these very rough lines depicting the road are also roughly drawn orthogonals. Um, so he's staying consistent with perspective. The relationship of this line and this line have a perspectival relationship to each other. So that's right. So he's also using, he's ve also very conscious of perspective, even though this isn't something like an arch uh, a series of clear architectural elements or a piazza or, or a city square that are e that's easily adaptable to perspective. Nevertheless, he's finding perspective here. That's exactly right. So line weight, consciousness of line weight, primarily to show depth, but also for other reasons, is something I want to introduce here at this stage. Um, so how is, so Michelangelo is doing something similar to Rembrandt. So this line here is showing us a muscle. It's part of a, a a complex of muscles on the arm that are called the extensor group. So the, the line de describing the extensor group is thicker because it's closer to us than the line of the hand. This part of the pad of the hand is closer to us than the thumb. So that's thicker than the thumb. Michelangelo now doesn't do that with absolute consistency. So this part of the figure is closer to us than this part but this part has a thicker line. He's doing that in part to show um, locations in space and he's pretty consistent about it. Um, you know, this line is thicker than these lines, but he's not absolutely consistent about it. He's doing other things in as well with line weight. What anyone, 
want to take a stab at what 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 else this thick line is helping to do, helping to communicate in the drawing? Uh, would it be helping like start off the shading of the forum? It is, it is reinforcing the shading, that's true. So it's, um, he's using line. So the line is lighter here where the, this part of the body is illuminated. Um, and it's, the line is broader, softer, um, and darker in parts of the drawing where the, the body is in shadow. That's true. Foreshortening? Uh, yeah, that's true. He's showing foreshortening because this is a foreshortened limb. And so that sort of relates to what we were talking about a few minutes ago in terms of space. So we, we read this as closer to us than this. That's true. Curvature? Curvature, for sure. What is, if you do this, if you, if you do the same thing this figure is doing with your arm and use your, use your left hand or use your left hand to touch this part of your arm, like hold, hold your left hand on this part of your arm and then turn your hand the way that Michelangelo's figure is turning his hand. What do you feel happen to the muscles right here? They shift around. They shift around. What they're actually doing is they're contracting. So the reason parts of our body are able to move is that muscles contract. The fibers of the muscles pull together and those muscles pull a part of the body in one direction or another. So in order for somebody's hand to bend at the wrist and twist that way, the muscles right here have to contract. So these muscles in this movement of the body get harder. They, they get, um, they contract and they feel harder to us than when the muscles are relaxed. So Michelangelo is showing us the contraction and hardening of that muscle mass with that thicker line. So Michelangelo is using line weight in a complex way. So there's a great variety of line weight in this, um, in this image. One other thing to point out about um, this drawing. So we talked about the way artists started to conceive of complicated forms in, in, in very simple geometric terms in order to be able to depict those forms in space. So it's not so obviously clear in this drawing as it is say in that Albrecht Durer geometric head, but look at the way Michelangelo has conceived of the lower arm here. Do you see how Michelangelo has conceived of the upper part of that lower arm as an egg-like shape? And then the wrist is conceived of as a kind of rectangular prism or a little rectangular box. And if you touch your wrist, notice how it has a kind of, we could conceive of it because of the closeness of the bones to the surface. It has a kind of rectangular structure compared to the relatively round egg-like shape of the upper arm. So Michelangelo's in this highly developed drawing, in this extremely sophisticated drawing, um, he's conceiving of the body in the terms that we've been talking about today. So um, what I want now to introduce in the drawing we're doing is um, I'd like to start thinking about notice other things in the drawing that you think could be depicted through various line weights. Um, I would encourage you to do that as well. So what do I mean by showing line, varying line weights? So maybe, um, I don't remember who pointed this out about the the use of line to show variations in light and shadow. But maybe as we're refining our line, the line describing the left-hand edge of this pepper could be a relatively soft line. And then where 
the pepper, the bottom of the pepper creates a cast shadow. Um, underneath the object. I can darken that line to start indicating the cast shadow and a darker line is also gonna help me uh, give a sense of weight to that pepper as it sits firmly on the plane of the tabletop. I can perhaps show deep in this line. Where the light yellow of the pepper meets the dark green of the stem. And if that line's darker than the lines describing the top edge of the pepper in the back, that's going to start helping reinforce a sense of space. Another thing I'm doing um, is I'm looking for overlaps in the contour. So the pepper is an object where overlaps are very obvious. So in other words, the contour here on the right hand side of the pepper is the contour of that swelling at the top of the pepper overlaps with the contour in back. So that's helping me show different levels of space. So I can, as I start to refine my um, ellipse on the teapot, I can make the line of the ellipse that's closer to us or the point of the ellipse that's closer to us. I can make that thicker and have the line get progressively lighter thinner as that form rolls backwards in space away from us. And I can continue to do that as I'm refining this drawing. So I'd like people to look in these still lives as you, as you develop your still life over the weekend. Look for opportunities to use line weight to show elements in the drawing that are closer. So I'm uh, using thicker line to show those elements that are closer, thinner line to, to show elements in the drawing that are, are moving away from us in space. So that you start to see how line weight can be used as a tool um, to start giving a sense of the complexity of the information you're looking at. So line weight, by the way, can also just have be, um, it can have an interest just for itself. You know, certainly artists vary line weight just because that very line weight in itself is considered to be pleasing in the drawing or formally. Um, it, it can give a kind of that variety, can give a kind of energy um, and interest in itself. It doesn't necessarily have to be attached to showing something like space, but it can certainly be used for that. So and I may make all of the lines of the cone lighter than all of the lines of the um, pepper. Again, to show different locations in space.
So use that technique, use that variety of line weights. As much, if every opportunity you can, look for it, whatever it can be used to um, give as much information about the setup as possible, even though we're doing a drawing with very limited means. In other words, we're just doing a line drawing. But make that line drawing give as much information as possible. So I'm going to I'll do a little bit more work on showing how to uh, further develop some of these details on the teapot, and then um, I'll wrap it up. So what I just did was I just rounded off some of those straight lines I used to show the spout. So you know, starting with straight lines, I think helped me really be able to convincingly show exactly that curve of the spout. And it's relatively easy to adjust the drawing that has been started with straight lines so that those straight lines turn into convincing um, convincing curves. So just looking for, just bringing in some of these further details here. Erasing some of my guidelines. Looking at the ellipse of the opening on the spout this. I'll clean up the edge of the division of the tabletop. I'm going to make this line relatively light. I'll subtly give this line a little bit more clarity. And then I'm going to make this line here 
darker still. Let's pull this forward in space. I'll continue to, to clarify that buried line weight here. So one um, final thing I want to, in, to show you is I want to again show you a step from a simple block in to um, a little bit more complexity. And let me move so that you get less of a distorted view. Let me just move this. It's still a bit distorted, but because I'm gonna be concentrating on the, um, the handle so you don't need to see the other part of the still life for now. So um, this, the still life we can think of as a kind of, um, in order to draw that convincingly, so it doesn't look like some kind of just weird noodle, let's, well, let's ask ourselves, what is that handle? That handle is, like if we actually think about it in its original piece of clay, right, that's, that, handle is a little bit like a modified plank of wood. So the, the, the um, ceramic artist, it's not made by hand, but like let's pretend it was, has taken a piece of clay that's something like a plank of wood and then has twisted that plank of wood around, right? So we, we want to draw this so that we are, we, we are convincingly depicting that volume, that specific volume. So that volume has a side just like a plank of wood does. And that meets the surface of the teapot in this little, I don't know what to call that. It has a base. And then the side plane of that handle merges off the base. And using our architecture, I'm going to wrap that side plane around in space. So in other words, what I'm saying is I want to make sure I draw the structure, this specific structure as it wraps around in space. I want to make sure to include all of the dimensions of that specific structure. I'm going to correct my drawing a little bit here. So something I haven't mentioned um, so far is negative space. Who knows what negative space is in drawing? Can anyone define negative space? Grace? Um You can go, Adriana. Okay, sorry. Let's say um, negative space is the 
<laughs> the open space not occupied by the components of the composition. Right. Um, and likewise, I'd say a good indicator for um, negative space is to just look at things in black and white and then see the inverse. Yeah, that, that's a good, so in other words, see the objects, let's say as black and then everything around them as white. Is that what you mean? Yeah. Yeah, thanks, Adriana. Yeah, so um, negative space would be, so like the positive space is the pepper, the pot. The negative space would be you know, these spaces between the objects. And, and we can, so we can think of the shape of the pepper when doing that drawing, but we can also think about that shape between them as a way of determining um, whether or not we're seeing things convincingly. And so as I was looking at um, my drawing of the teapot, it occurred to me that the negative space between the handle and the pot was not convincing. So I'm going to um, adjust that. And that's going to help me see more convincingly that specific or the specifics of that um, teapot. Excuse me, the handle for that teapot. And so my side plane around something like this. And I, I, I'm to be honest with you, not, in my opinion, not quite getting this right, but I'm not gonna go through the agony and the labor of trying to get it exactly right and torture you all as you watch me do that. You know, there are some artists who can just get those things right, right away. But I, I find certain things I need to labor over. And, and by the way, I, I want to just emphasize that I, I think that this kind of, you know, I just use the phrase labor over. So I think that training yourself to be able to see see and record shapes, um, angles, structure as accurately as possible is a very useful tool. But I never want to imply that that determines the quality of a work of art because in itself it doesn't. And I just want to make that clear. Um, I think it's a very valuable skill. All of these skills can be used in themselves or in conjunction with other approaches to make very beautiful, moving work. But there are obviously artists who work representationally, right? They make representational drawings or paintings, but they're not that concerned with accurate observation, right? So, you know, like Van Gogh, who was a very great artist, was never able to really do this. He tried very hard when he was first teaching himself to be an artist. He tried very hard to do these kinds of academic things and he never really got it. He just didn't have the innate ability to do that for whatever reason, but, Van Gogh is a, a great, great artist. So I think it's, but you know, I, but he struggled enormously to do it. And I, you know, I, I do think that, that that effort he put in taught him many things about drawing. And actually, if we look at, and, I, and maybe we will, look at Van Gogh's drawings, many of the things that we've been talking about, he does in his drawing, like, if, you, if anyone's interested, you could look up a Van Gogh landscape drawing. Um, like there's, a, in particular, there's a drawing he did of, I was gonna say an olive grove, but I may be wrong about that. That may not be exactly what it is. I, I'll show you in a couple minutes, actually. So, 
So I'm just adjusting. Now this too, um, we can think about perspective in how we draw this. So if I look at the line that defines the place where, so a line here that defines the way that edge, the edge of the um, handle turns away from me. And then when I look at a series of points on this handle and ask myself, what's the relationship? Or, or better yet, I can think of this handle as a series of planes. Planes that are making up this curvature. And when I do that, I can think of those planes as all corresponding to the perspective scheme of the space that this teapot is in. And that helps me draw the curve of this plane like um, handle convincingly in space. And I'm gonna, I'm going to make a core, or I'm gonna make a relationship between the way the top of the handle sits on the surface of the teapot and the way the bottom of the handle does. Okay, so I think, and I, you know, I would continue to work on this drawing, continue refining the drawing, adding more elements. Um, I would continue to look for those variations in line weight we talked about. So if I'm doing it in that kind of consistent Rembrandt-like way, I would make, say, these parts of the lines darker and have them slowly get lighter. Um, and I would, I would refine this a bit more um, before finishing. So this will be the project for today, the rest of the class today, and um, to complete over the weekend. So you're, I'd like you to set up a still life of three objects. Include as a kind of reference, um, include as a kind of reference a simple object. So perhaps your cone, or if you want to include a simple box, um, have a more complex object, you know, like, the tea, like that teapot, but it could be any number of different objects. I, I would avoid something that's too complicated, like don't include a doll. You know, I would avoid like a doll with an elaborate lace dress. I don't know why that popped into my head or, um, you know, like the trophy you won for playing field hockey with a kind of elaborate gold field hockey player, you know, sitting atop a pedestal. You know, I, I mean, I, I would avoid something that's too complicated because you complicated because you want to just concentrate on the transition from simple geometric forms and perspective to progressively more complex, so somewhat more complex, and then include an organic object. Pepper's a good choice. Um, a, a pepper, a, an orange, a grapefruit would be fine. A quince would be good if anyone knows what that is. A pomegranate would be great. 
if anyone wants to grab a pomegranate. Certain pears are great. Um, some, some pears have a very distinct planar structure. Some don't, like those smooth brown pears, which taste gross. Um, those don't, but look, like those yellow pears are good. Um, but it, it could be any number of organic um, things. Again, avoid something that's too complicated, like a head of, head of cauliflower, I don't think would work so well. Um, but anyway, does, does that make sense, the elements to choose to put in your still life? Yeah, um, can I show you, I have this thing from my daughter, if it would work as like, instead of the teapot. Sure, uh, let me just, I'm gonna stop the share.